أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد ورحمة علماء my dear elders Brothers, sisters, children, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So, we're in the last, probably the last night of the month of the Hijjah. So, it's a good time to remind ourselves or to pick up this topic as to how to prepare for Muharram, how to look at the holy. This month of, of Muharram. It's an alternative way of looking at Karbala. This is the topic uh, for tonight. Naturally, when the month of Muharram comes in, in the solar calendar, usually December, New Year, this celebration. In our case, yesterday somebody was asking me. Uh, one of the African brothers that why don't we celebrate when it's our new year, the Islamic new year. But the answer is very obvious that it's a month of mourning uh, for us. And we try to create an environment around us. So this last few days of the Hijjah we saw black clothes being put up in the Imbab Barga. Mafil Abbas and different places and people getting their black clothes ready to be worn from tomorrow night and there are some who wear it till the month of Rabiul Awal not only that but our travels will now be reduced our holidays not travels our holidays now nobody would go on a holiday or they'll try to avoid going on a holiday during this time. If they would travel, they'll travel for ziyara or maybe for business. But just to create that environment of, of mourning. The act of matam, beating the chest. And then it peaks on the day of Ashura, whereby people dress up accordingly. Some people go to an extreme of not greeting and not shaking hands but just to create uh, that environment of, of mourning. When I was in India, they even changed their diet. In the month of Muharram, they changed their diet. So some don't eat meat in the first 10 days or first 12 days of, of Muharram. And nothing wrong with this. There's nothing wrong with this. It is creating a crucible. It's creating a sufuria. It's creating a pot in which something should be cooked. And we should see the product. Our Bohara brothers have gone a step ahead this year. For those of you who have Bohara friends. So this year they've been told to close their businesses. Usually what was happening was they had lecture sessions in the morning. So some would open the shops and then close at around 9, 10. And then 2 o'clock, once they come out from the mosque, they would open the shops again till 5. This year, they have been told by the leader to close their businesses for 10 days. So all businesses closed. They have sent out notices to TRA, to the people around. No business in the 10 days of Muharram. So I was asking a senior member of the Bohora community. So he said this was overdue. This was supposed to be announced long back. But this year, the leader felt that the community is ready to implement this law. That the businesses will be closed for the first 10 days of, of Muharram. And when you ask them why, so the reason was, 
کہ امام حسین علیہ السلام is in suffering and there is غم so we should not be participating in anything joyous or worldly and rightly so uh, it should be respected but as I say this is just a crucible it's just a sufuria and we have the ingredients we need to put them together and come up with a product and that doesn't happen most of the time so we concentrate on the crucible most of the time and there's nothing wrong with that we create that environment we hold on to the symbols and the symbols are the ones that have passed on this message of Imam Hussein from generation to generation so nobody should convince us or tell us that no leave all this and go for something else no whatever we have we should hold on to it the majalis the beating of the chest the dressing up the diet putting black clothes on the walls all that should be maintained if it's closing your business for the 10 days to concentrate be it so but it should not stop there something should come out of it so this video is very appropriate Shaheed Kirmani is one product out of that crucible he didn't all he didn't stop at the symbols but started implementing the values of Karbala in his life when I was in grade 5 we had art classes and our teacher was Mr. Shaibu who is still alive till today and he's an artist and he has his own um, I think they call it a studio or an exhibition whereby he puts up his paintings a very good artist and he was our teacher so I remember the very first class he took us out and in Arusha school in Arusha we had a library building a very simple building right in the middle of the school which happened to be our library so he made us sit in the garden opposite the library and he told us draw a sketch of this library and I remember I couldn't draw it I just drew something but it didn't look anything like what was in front of me but I had a friend from India he was an expatriate his name was Samir I still remember he came up with a fantastic drawing of the library he was sitting there just right next to me we we're looking at the same building and he came up with a classic sketch which looked very similar to what we were seeing and I was very impressed and then I copied that image so when it came to copying his image I could do it when I saw his image on a piece of paper and I tried to copy it it turned out good but I couldn't put that building on the piece of paper this is an artist's mind so some people look at the painting some people look at the drawing some people try to copy it but there are some researchers who look into the mind of the artist what is happening inside and numerous studies have been done that what is different in an artist's mind what is it that brings about this creativity so they say okay, there is a difference an artist's mind has some centers in the brain which are associated with fine motor skills those centers are more developed in artists so similarly when it comes to looking at the event of, of Karbala whatever happened we all look at the same event the historical facts are all there in front of us so some of us just read the story and weep but there are some artists who can take real good lessons from this event so what I have done is I have chosen three books and I'm just going to read out points from their introduction as to what is going on in the minds of these ulama who are writing these books about the event of, of Karbala so the first book is Sacred Effusion you all must have heard about the book Sacred Effusion it's a commentary of Zarat Ashura written by our own 
Sheikh Muhammad Khalfan of Qum. May Allah bless him and elevate his status and increase his knowledge, uh, inshallah. And fantastic the way he, he writes. So Sheikh Khalil Jafar in his introduction to this book, uh, right at the beginning of the book he says, what has happened all these years is books have been written in Arabic and Farsi and translated into English. Most of the Islamic literature that we have is in Arabic and Farsi which is now being translated into English. So very little as far as English is concerned. He says this is one book that will have to be translated into the Arabic language and Farsi language so that the Arabic and Farsi speaking people can benefit. Fantastic, his English and his thought process. So just a few tips from his book and how he looks at this whole event of, of Karbala. So in other words, in the first 10, 12 days of Muharram, there are people who physically go for the ziyar of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. There'll be a group leaving now going to Karbala to pay the respect to Imam. But us who are not that fortunate will be doing the same sitting here. So the process is called Ziyara. We call it Ziyara. Everybody knows what Ziyara is. We, it's loosely translated as visitation. Visiting the Imam, saluting the Imam. So we say we recite the Ziyara. It's actually doing the Ziyara. But he goes into the deep meaning of ziyarah. He said ziyarah comes from the word zawr. And zawr actually means to distance oneself from something. So if you just read this sentence, it's the opposite meaning now. Ziyarah comes from the word zawr, which means to distance oneself from something. But he says, no, the reason it has been used for ziyarah is because the person himself who is, who is the Zair, he distances himself from everything other than the Imam in the holy month of Muharram or when he goes for Ziyar. So Zawr, for example, a lie, when you speak a lie, it's called Zawr. Why? Because you're distancing yourself from the truth. But in this case, you say you distance yourself from everything worldly, except the Imam whom you're visiting. So the Bohoras are trying to implement this. They've been told, distance yourself from everything for these first 10 days of, of Muharram, except the event of Karbala, the Imam. And then he quotes a few ulama. So Ayatollah Haddad, Al Musawi, he writes about him in this introduction. He says he was heard. He says that when I go to Karbala, this mystic is saying, when I go to Karbala and I look around, I hear people clinging on to the grave of Imam Hussein salam and asking the wasila of Imam Hussein salam for their worldly gains. And he says, what I feel is they are asking for a burden on top of the burdens that they already have. They've already come with burdens and now they are asking for an extra burden in their lives. Ideally, he says, you should be going to Karbala, hold on to the grave of Imam Hussain alayhi salam and tell Imam Hussain, oh Imam, I use your wasila and ask Allah to free me from these worldly attachments. That should be the spirit. So that's the spirit of, of Muharram. This is the way people look at Imam Hussain, an alternative way. So I was reading the book of Ali Chit Sazian, Shaheed Chit Sazian, and you see the spirit in this shuhada of the Iran-Iraq war or of the Syria war or the other shuhada when you read their biographies, 
So Ali Chit Sazian, a young man wanting to get married now, and when he meets his fiancée, or she was not the fiancée, it was just during the stage of spouse selection, he was meeting her for the first time. Nothing had been accepted. They were talking for the first time. And the first thing he tells this lady is, Imam Hussein is first in my life. So although you have to be prepared, you are getting married to me, but be prepared, I'm going to be spending most of my time on the war front. If you are happy with that, we can get married. If not, then you can find somebody else who can spend more time with you. I'm not saying this should be the spirit. Nobody is saying you spend more time in the Imam Barga and leave your wives at home, no. But this was for a greater cause. There was a call uh, from an Islamic call, I would say. It was not to save the Iranian nation, but it was to save Islam. It was an Islamic govern government being established. And there was a call and we had people standing up to do this. And she says, you know, I always wanted to get married to a Basiji, to a soldier. So I accept and your proposal and they got married. Another story that Sheikh Khalfan narrates. So Chit Sazian was not Sheikh Khalfan. This is just that I had read. Ayatullah Mujtahidi, he quotes Haji Sheikh Abdul Karim Hayri, who was the founder of the Hausa and Qum. He was seen in the haram of Imam Hussein alayhi salam weeping and saying out loud that, Oh Imam Hussein, I have become a mujtahid, but I have come to you because I want to become a perfect human being. So he's attained the status of ijtihad, he's become a mujtahid, but he's going to Imam telling him that, I've become a mujtahid, but what I want is to become a perfect human being. This is the way people look at Karbala and Imam Hussain alayhi salam. In his second volume, so this was volume one. In his second volume, Sheikh Khalfan, in his introduction again, he talks about the microcosmic vision. What is the microcosmic vision? He says, all our external actions that we perform, they are called the macro cosmic actions. So he says before we do an action outside or before our actions are seen, that action has already taken place at the microcosmic level, at the level of the nafs. So every action takes place at the level of the nafs, of the human nafs, and then it shows out as the action. So that's the importance of the nafs, the human soul. So he says the whole event of Karbala, the people who killed Imam Hussein, even before they killed him, at the microcosmic level, they had already martyred, they had already killed the innocent Imam Hussein within themselves. That was their aql. Their intellect within themselves, within their nafs, was killed, was martyred, and that's why they couldn't come out and perform that action that they performed. So he gives an example of Surah Shams. A'udhu billahi min shaytanu rajim, bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Wa shamsi wa duhaha, wa al-qamari idha talaha, wa al-nahari idha jallaha, wa al-layhi idha yakshaha. It goes on. Then, wa nafsi wa ma sawaha, fa alhamaha fujuraha, wa taqwaha. The nafs has already been told what is right and what is wrong. You martyr the Imam Hussein, the innocent soul within you, then it will be very easy for you to do it outside. So this is scary because we could be participating in these events, but if you don't reflect within ourselves, it's very likely that we could be crying for the Imam Hussein outside but we are the ones who have killed the Imam Hussein within ourselves. It's a very scary thought when you read this. There's another verse, chapter 17, verse number 84. He quotes it again. He says, Qul, Kullu ya'amalu ala shakilatihi 
فَرَبُّكُمْ أَعْلَمُ بِمَنْ هُوَ أَهْدَى سَبِيلًا Say, each works according to his manner, according to his character. So when you work, you work according to your character. Your character has already been formed within your nafs and you act accordingly. But your Lord is most knowing of who is best guided in his way. So Allah says in the Quran again, chapter 41, verse number 53, سَنُرِيهِمْ آيَاتِنَا فِي الْآفَاقِ وَفِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَهُمْ أَنَّهُ الْحَقِّ أَوَلَمْ يَكْفِي بِرَبِّكَ أَنَّهُ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ شَهِيدٍ We will soon show them our signs in the horizons, outside and within themselves. This is the verse that he uses. Until it becomes clear to them that that is the truth. So we might fool people outside, but there'll come a time when our inner character will show outside. So what he's trying to say here is that we are, when we're doing salam, because the second volume is about the salam and the la'an, he explains it in detail. So when we're doing salam, it's the respect for the Hussein within us, the Husseini, the godly characters within us. And la'an, is not cursing as it is translated in English. People use this English translation and they say, no, the Shias curse our leaders. No, it's not curse, we're not cursing. But we're distancing ourselves from those characteristics within us, the Yazidi characteristics within us. That is the whole purpose of La'an. So salam and la'an, it's a spiritual practice. And that's why most of the ulama, Imam Khomeini had this habit, Ayatollah Bahjat, and so many more scholars, it's mentioned in this book, had this habit of reciting Zarat Ashura on a daily basis, some of them twice a day. And they would recite this salam hundred times and they would do the la'an a hundred times. We do it only on the day of Ashura, even that, with a lot of difficulty, we sleep, we doze off. These people used to do it on a daily basis because it was a spiritual practice. They were looking within themselves, saluting the Husseini characteristics within themselves and trying to distance themselves with the Yazidi characters within their nafs. So this is one scholar. This is the way he looks at Karbala, the depth. Although he's talking about Ziyarat Ashura, but the way they look at Imam Hussein alayhi salam. So it's not the narrative, not the historical facts, but now they're going into the Baatul. One. The second book is by Sheikh Jawad Shomali. This book was released June 2022. I'm grateful to my friend who gifted it to me. It's a commentary on Dua'i Arafat which again was recited by Imam Hussein alayhi salam on the day of Arafah. So in his introduction, he mentions the same thing. He says there are two ways of narrating Ashura. So one way, it is the tragedies that are recorded in the history books. Nafasul Mahmoom of Sheikh Abbas Qumni, and there's another narration by other scholars, the authentic ones. And that is what scholars use to read out in the days of, of Muharram. So he says that is one way of narrating the event of Karbala. But Sheikh Jawad says that this way of narrating the event of Karbala, if you go to see it is talking more about what the enemies did. And the Ahlul Bayt were just pure, they were just victims, passive victims of the cruelty of the Bani Umayyad. So he says there's nothing wrong in narrating it. These are historical facts. But what it's doing is, it's talking more about what the enemies did rather than what Imam Hussein really was. So his intention is to show how did Imam Hussein uh, plan his life, how, how did he manage him and Bibi Zainab and all the others, how did they manage 
to withstand all this cruelty and still maintain their composure and their personalities and a positive outlook. So, he that is why he goes into the commentary of Dua Arafat. He says if you read Dua Arafat and if you go through the commentary, it will show you who was Imam Hussain alayhi salam. He says this is the best way to know the Imam himself. So, this is another way of looking. He is trying to trace the character of Imam Hussain alayhi salam. So, he is doing the same thing like going into the artist's mind. There was something that was done by Imam Hussain. We can look at his actions and weep. But what he is trying to do is he is trying to go inside and see what was going on through Imam Hussain's heart. Number two. And the third author. This is one of my favorite books. It's available in our Tabligh bookshop. I don't know if they're still available though. There were very few copies uh, available. Sorry? Yes. It's Karbala. The untold reality of uh, Karbala. Sayyid Saeed Basam Tabar, a scholar from uh, New Zealand. And what he has done is he's compiled information from the other top scholars, Atul Ajwadi Amuli, Atul Hassan Zadi Amuli. And how do they look at Karbala? He has gathered all this information and he's put it into this book. And fantastic. If I just go through the through the index, the things that he's covered. He talks about knowledge and action, a paradigm shift, understanding Muharram, an existential look at Muharram, Tasu'a and Ashura. You know, Tasu'a and Ashura, we feel that it's just a number. We call it Tasu'a is the ninth of Muharram, Ashura is the tenth of Muharram. And it's, it's, it's very obvious that all that happened in Karbala happened on the tenth of Muharram, and Tasu'a was the day before. But he goes into the detail, says, no, this was not a coincidence. Whatever was planned had to happen on the ninth and the tenth. Ashura, the martyrdom was supposed to happen on the ninth. They asked for one more day. So ninth became Tasu'a and tenth became Ashura. So ninth, it, Tasu'a comes from the word Ittisa. Ittisa means growth and development, intensification. That was the day when Imam Hussain alayhi salam and his companions prepared themselves for the day to come. They had to prepare themselves, widen their chest, the spiritual chest, to be able to understand and fathom what was going to happen the next day, to rise up spiritually. And Ashura, Ashura means Mu'ashura, communication, interaction, being in touch. That's the day all their senses came together and they could see what others couldn't. There are hadith which show that they were shown their places in heaven. So because of Taswa'a, because they had spiritually prepared themselves so much, that spiritually elevated themselves so much, that they could see what we couldn't see, or what a normal person couldn't see on the day of Ashura. So Taswa'a and Ashura, this is the spiritual side of the event of Karbala. Not only that, there's another chapter, he says, potentiality into actuality. He says, all the Ashab who participated in Karbala, they all had the potential, the spiritual potential. But Imam Hussain alayhi salam was the one who converted that potential into actuality. And that's the reason, he says, he was the last person to be martyred, Imam Hussain alayhi salam. Because he made sure that each and every ashab of his reaches his actuality before he was martyred himself. So it is only the Imam of the time who can take you from potentiality into actuality. Imam Hussain alayhi salam was the Imam of the time. He had his best companions. They were sieved 
through time from Makkah to Medina and the journey there's so many people who ran away there's some people who ran away on Tasu'a when they had to prepare themselves there's some who ran away but those who remained were the cream and Imam Hussain Ali Salam made sure that they reach their actuality on the day of Ashur and that's why he was the last one to be martyred he talks about the different types of the animal soul this is a hadith of Imam Ali alayhi salam to Kumail, his, his companion. Kumail asks him about the soul. And then Imam Ali says, which soul? He says, oh, there are many types of souls. He says, yes. And he mentions this hadith. So he says, there's one which is the vegetative soul. Imam Ali alayhi salam tells Kumail, the vegetative soul. So when a human being is conceived, it becomes an embryo in the mother's womb it's like a vegetable the vegetative soul it's like a vegetable so it's called nafsun nabatiya and then the animalistic soul when it's born nafsul haywaniya so when we are young and some of us still we die we are stuck in this level whereby we are just satisfying our animal desires animalistic desires eating sexual desires, sleeping. So he says, the more you engage and you get addicted to these habits, it keeps you in this animalistic level. You will not progress. And then a level higher is the intellectual soul, whereby the akal comes into control. It comes to control the desire, the anger, imagination of the human being. So it's a level higher. And the last one is the universal soul. So all the Ashab, the companions of Imam Hussain salam, rose through these levels. And Imam Hussain salam, made sure that they all rise to the level of the intellectual soul or even higher. But the beauty is, the hadith tells us that the Safina to Najah, I'm paraphrasing, and this hadith has also been mentioned in this book. That all the Aima alayhi salam are Safinatun Najah. But Imam Hussain alayhi salam's Safina, they say, is the widest and the fastest. When the Imam was asked, that all of you are Safinatun Najah, he says, Imam Hussain alayhi salam's ship is the widest, so it can accommodate most people, many people and it moves faster, you can ascend faster on this path of Imam Hussain alayhi salam. And this is shown on the day of Ashura, this Ashab, the few Ashab who joined at the last moment, they were not even Muslims, some of them. But because of the presence of the Imam, they could rise through these levels of nafs, from the animalistic to the intellectual and higher. Hur was one of them. Hur till the last moments was almost stuck and he would have died in the animalistic level. But he chose his sides well and he rose. So this is the way they look at Karbala, that Imam has the potential to take you up, but as long as you follow the, the principles. So the bottom line is, Karbala has people who take these lessons from Karbala. It makes people bigger than life itself. So just as it was mentioned for Shahid Kirmani, he says he was not an individual, but he was a nation. There are some people who take these values of Karbala and then when you see them, they become bigger than life. The things that they achieve it's, people cannot fathom, people cannot imagine as to how this person achieved so much in this short time. So look at our Mujtahideen, for example, Imam Khomeini, Ayatollah Sistani, Ayatollah Khoi, and the other scholars who are there. That is one level. You look at the Shuhada of the Iran, Iraq war, Shahid Ibrahim Hadi, Ali Chitza Zian, and the recent scientists 
who are coming up now, Fakhr Zade, Shaheed Fakhr Zade, for example. And people in front of us, within our own communities, there are people who have really taken these values and you see them ascending. So in reality, we have a very rich bank and a very unique bank in front of us through which all of us can, can ascend. But what happens is usually we concentrate only on the rituals, which we should, but we need to take it a step ahead if we start applying it in our lives. So a little bit of, of knowledge in, in reading and then knowledge and action, start applying them in our lives. So the whole process of going through Muharram is about purification of the nafs. Person looks into himself, he purifies himself. Yes, he listens to the majalis, he does matam, he participates in the niyaz sessions that are there, he participates in the julus. But his main focus is the journey within. And scholars now through their research have shown us the path. So it's on, upon us now. This Muharram that is coming, inshallah, scholars will be sharing their knowledge with us, but we also need to make an effort. We should attend this Majalis. We should be part of this Safina, which is wider, easily understandable, and it's faster. But we should have the zeal and intention to put all this into practice. Whatever we read, put it into practice. And inshallah, we will, we will uh, progress, inshallah. Sayyid Hassan Nasrullah, I thought I, I will just uh, mention this. They wanted to write his, his biography. And out of his humility, he refused. He says, no. So I think Al Mayadeen, for those of you who follow Al Mayadeen channel, the director, the CEO of Al Mayadeen, um, he has published five set of interviews in different times with Sayyid Hassan uh, Nasrullah. And before his previous interview, I was just reading his introduction, the way he introduces. He says, This is one man, when he speaks, people listen. And when he is silent, also people listen. People are so eager to listen to him that even when he's silent, they're worried. So in this interview, he asks him that why in the month of January or December and January, there's no word from you. So he says, there was no occasion. Usually I have to speak on an occasion. So there was no occasion in January and February. So I did not speak. But people were eager, sending messages that no, <laughs> we want to just hear from you. But yet it's the same man out of his humility. In his last interview, he's speaking and he breaks up into tears. And when they ask him what happened, he says, it's just the loyalty of my followers which makes me cry. And then he goes back to the event of Karbala. He says, Imam Hussein was there. It was the loyalty of his companions that made Imam Hussein Ali Salam cry. And it makes me weep today. This man is living in Karbala. When he looks at his followers, he sees the loyalty of the followers of Imam Hussein Ali Salam. And just the way the companions of Imam Hussein Ali Salam brought letters to Imam, not the people of Kufa, but the people who wrote to show their loyalty to Imam Hussein Ali Salam. So the people on the front, the Hezbollah fighters, they write a letter to Sayyid Hassan Nasrullah showing their commitment and giving their allegiance. And Sayyid Nasrullah uh, replies. So you can see the event of Karbala unfolding in the lives of these people. And they use the same slogan. Recently, this Karish oil rig that is going on. So Lebanon has asked for a loan of $3 billion from IMF or World Bank. And this is humiliation. When you ask for a loan to take care of their uh, affairs. And here you have an oil rig 
which is supposed to be part of Lebanon, it is worth 600 billion dollars. He says this, this can solve all our problems. Then he says verily war is better than humiliation. Hayhat min Abdullah, exactly the same slogan that is being used. So here we have personalities in front of us who are applying the principles of Karbala and you see the effect. It is creating waves uh, around the world. So it is a lesson for us. Yes, there was a personality 1400 years back, but we have personalities in front of us who are creating waves. And Sayyid Basam Tabar, at the end of his book, has given 17 principles that inshallah we will discuss some other day. What are the principles that we can take from Karbala, apply it in ourselves so that we can become the soldiers of the 12th uh, Imam? Fantastic. The, the last part of, the, of this book that inshallah we will discuss it uh, some other day as and when we, we do get the chance inshallah. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzat amma yasifun. Wassalamun ala al-mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.